They're still recording it. I don't know. It's out of my, my depth. I'm going to ask my grandchildren or my son, my children, they'll tell me. Or Velvel. Anyway, just pointing out the, the pure, there was a pure report, you know, that does a, these studies on the state of, of American jury, which they do from time to time. So the last results are very telling. And there's an article in the Jerusalem Post um, highlighting the, uh, the results and what it means for North American jury. Quite fascinating. I'll post it later. You can look at it later if you haven't seen it already, but it's an easy search on the Jerusalem Post. Pure report, of course, you'll do that after our class. Okay, let's begin, friends. So, um, Peggy, would you start for us? Do you have the text? Are you unmuted? Let's see. No, you're still muted. Okay. Now you're good. We can't see you, but we can hear your voice. That's oh, sorry. You don't <laughs> want to see me right now. Trust me. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. A pillar of our faith. The Rambam writes, every person is fit to be righteous like Moshe, our teacher, or wicked like Yeruvam. Just stop for a second. Who was Yeruvam? Yeruvam, he's, he's uh, cited as a kind of the symbol of, of wickedness because he led so many others astray. So it's one thing to be individually wicked. It's another to be a terrible influence. The story with him was, he was the one responsible for the split in the Jewish people, the breakaway after King David died and his son Rehovam assumed the, the throne and he taxed the people uh, very heavily. And because of that, uh, it, it, a rebellion uh, fomented, led by this Yerovan ben Avod, and the rebellion led to literally a division, a breakaway. Ten tribes broke away from under the leadership of King David, forming their own kingdom, known as the Northern Kingdom or the Kingdom of Ephraim or the Kingdom of Israel. Ephraim was the dominant tribe. Israel, because they were most of the Jews. And the Southern Kingdom was called the Kingdom of Judah. And of course, as you all know, they disappeared. They were invaded by the king of Assyria before the destruction of the first temple, taken into captivity and disappeared, referred to ever since the last 10 tribes. This year of them was responsible for that. Not only was there a breakaway, he actually for, he saw to it that Jews should not, the northern kingdom, those 10 tribes, should not go to the temple, which is located in the southern kingdom, in the territory between Judah and Benjamin. Because he knew if they're going to go to the Beis Hamikdash Holy Temple three times a year as mandate in the Torah, he'll lose control. Mm. And they put up he put up roadblocks. This was like a Berlin Wall, the first Berlin Wall, that uh, and guards, not allowing Jews in the north to go to the Beis Hamikdash. He made his own, eventually a duplicate kind of temple. His capital was a place called Shamron, Samaria, familiar to all of us. And uh, so he is cited, is the arch typical, is that the term, archetypal? What's the term? Mm -hmm. Yeah? A symbol of the sinner. Because not only, you know, he sinned, but I mean, the consequences, generations, an entire chunk of our people lost. You know, there are millions, millions of people out there that are Jewish and don't know it. If it's the maternal mother to child that just continues uninterruptedly, which explains, by the way, converts, for the most part, righteous converts, they really are Jewish. And many of them are simply members of, of our people that just didn't know it, don't know it, and for generations disconnected, but feeling the urge to come back, because that's who they are. Anyway, so that was just to give you, tell, to tell you who this Yerovam was, Yerovam Ben Devot was his name. So back to the Rambam, he's saying, we all have choice. We can be as righteous and virtuous as Moshe or as wicked as Yeruvim. Continue, please. <clears throat> there is no one who compels him, decrees upon him, or leads him to either of these two paths. Instead, it is he on his own initiative and thought who tends to the path he desires. So the Rambam is positing a great principle of our faith, <clears throat> free choice. 
Uh, this is the most difficult. Uh, it, it's a very thorny issue and it has endless layers. And you know, I've, I've spoken about it. Um, and it's not the subject today to reconcile free choice with divine providence and, and many other factors. If you're interested in that, it is, it is the most difficult subject to, to grasp. After all is said and done, we cannot reconcile it fully, intellectually. And I explain why, in fact, intellectual and free choice, which I, I encourage you to watch. Uh, I, I uh, was here in MTC, many of you were there. It was a big turnout that night, several hundred people came. Um, it was in response also to people urging me to give this lecture, but also because of, of um, a very popular writer and he has a blog. His name is Harris, I forgot his first name, uh, who argues that there's no free choice. A very, very uh, um, a deep thinker. And I address his conclusion. And of course, argue with him and explain why I do. So if you want to listen to that, by all means, I'm just cautioning you, it's very, very nuanced. And it, it really requires listening to, to the lecture um, more than once. That's, that's how complex it is. You'd have, have to listen to it at least twice or three times, especially the end, because it gets really nuanced and, and uh, subtle and inherently contradictory, but it has to be this way, why it isn't, why it is. Just a heads up. Okay, I'm sorry, I blocked you again, Peggy. Can I just put on the mute or so unblock yourself again, please, and continue reading. But what he's saying now is that on a, an overt basic level, we have free choice. That's certainly true in terms of consciousness. Nothing compels you to make your choices in life, your moral choices we're talking about. Not choices whether you want to be rich or not. There's a certain area of free choice there as well, but not necessarily, you know, just with all the effort in the world, intelligence, some people just never get there and they put in more effort than others. But and certainly if you're going, you want to be, you know, who your parents are, who your children are, you don't have choice over this stuff. Over health issues, it's in your DNA, you can't change a lot of that either. Exercise, eat well, that's a choice. And that, doctors say, contributes to longevity, not more than 20%, and some argue even less. It's a DNA thing, you know, live long or not. And at this point, we don't have choice to tamper with that, although we're getting there. Science is getting there. But at this point, you don't have a choice in any of these things. When we say, or not entirely, very limited, when we say you have free choice, it's to make moral decisions. Righteous as Moshe should have been, as Moses, or wicked as Yeravam, that's completely up to us. Continue. This principle. This principle is a fundamental concept and a pillar on which rests the Torah and its commandments. As it is written, behold, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. That is, the choice is yours. Yeah. I just want to add that even by, by the morally, it's clear we don't all have the same free choice morally. Why? because of environment. And what if I don't even know, you know, what's the moral thing? No one taught me. So I can't be responsible for not doing the right thing, but I didn't even though it was right, had never saw an example and so on. So I just want to qualify. When the Rambam says we have free choice to do what's right or wrong, good or evil, death or life, it is relative to our knowledge. And God decides that. Born in an environment, that, how would I know? Mind you, it gets very complex, not complex, but uh, detailed. There's also the choice to find out. But even that, it, thank God, only God is the judge. Because even the choice, you know, there's morality, you're not seeing it here, find out what it is and observe it. To what degree are we culpable? It's all Hashem decides. It's all relative. So it's not the same free choice even morally for everybody else. Someone who has more education is more responsible. Brought up in the environment where there are many, you know, in, where the environment is overwhelmingly a moral one and you act immorally, that makes you more responsible if you're living in a generally immoral, corrupt environment and you just went along with the tide. So the degree of responsibility, only Hashem is the judge. Only God can know every factor that goes into 
our life, our makeup, our disposition, our struggles, our environment. But at the end of the day, in whatever context, you know, you should know better is relative to you and what you should know, but it always applies. There's always an area of free choice, of the moral choice, to one degree or another. Okay, was that clear? Yeah. Yeah, in essence. Okay, continue, please, Peggy, thanks. Any one of the mortal acts which a person desires to do, he may, whether good or evil. The creator does not compel or decree that people should do either good or bad. Instead, everything is left to their own choice. God does not... Okay, I'm just going to comment. Okay, continue. Finish, finish till the end. Yeah. God did not create man to be an automaton. Instead, he gave him free choice, which distinguishes him from all other forms of life. All other existence is ruled by the laws of nature. Man, by contrast, has the power to control his conduct and act according to his own initiative. Right. So as intelligent as animals might be, like the dolphins and dogs, the two of the most highly intelligent, and elephants, way up there as well, um, there's no moral choice. They can't consider themselves. They can't consider, how am I doing? Is this right or wrong? They're driven by, by instinct, playful, aggressive, whatever the instinct happens to be. And so no animal is held culpable morally. Um, we all have we all have this free choice. Now, I just want to address, because it's, it's tempting. You know, one of the questions I address in the lecture, which is not the problem with free choice, really, but I'm going to address it now because it's, for many people, it's a stumbling block, but that's easily resolved. And that is God knows. So if God knows the future, what choice do I, do I have? That's easily addressed, relatively speaking. Here's the answer to that, to God's choice. Because God's beyond time, he knows what I'm going to choose because I chose it. Okay? A deep answer, but a very profound answer. The question is, it's written. Written in the books already. God knows. So what choice do I have? It's predetermined. The answer is not predetermined. Because what's written in the books is what you choose now because God is beyond time. And that book, metaphorically, whatever image, imagery you, you fancy, um, that book is beyond time as well. Everything is now for God. It's all in the present tense. There's no past, present, and future. All of history is now. So it's my choice that's the knowledge. Because I did it. That's why God knows it. He just knows it now because he's beyond time. That's not the problem with free choice. Although for many people, that's like the big stumbling block. God knows. What, as you just heard, that's easily resolved. And there are many other answers too. The real problem with free choice is something else, which listen to the lecture and you'll hear. That's not our subject today. Let's get back to the idea of choice. So I interrupted you a lot, Peggy. So I'm going to ask you to read another piece. If you don't mind. You have to unmute. Peggy, you need to un unmute yourself. Uh, let me have gone. Let's see. Ask to unmute. Rabbi? Yes. I, I don't know if you're asking me to continue, but I had to take a call for work and I'll oh. be back in two minutes. Okay, so go ahead. You go after the door. All right, so I'll, I'll ask another reader. Okay. Thank right. you. Okay. Uh, okay, I just... No, uh, it's okay. Yeah, so you have to mute yourself again. Hold on, I, I'm going back I'll do. I'll, I'll do that. I'll mute you. Okay, you're good. All right, now let's get back to... I, I can't even see who's here. Okay, Ethel. <clears throat> Two types of choice. The exercise of free choice lies at the heart of our divine service. We have the option of carrying out God's will or ignoring it, heaven forbid. Our challenge is to choose life, living our lives as he desires them to be led. 
In particular, two types of positive choice are expected of us. A, obedience to the mitzvahs of the Torah. God has given us a multifaceted set of deeds which we are obligated to perform and others which we are forb forbidden to perform. At times, doing the deeds required of us or observing the prohibitions opposed upon us involves inner conflict for the doing or not doing may run contrary to our natural tendencies and desires. Our power of choice enables us to control and negate any inner obstacles that hinder the fulfillment of God's will. All right, so in summary, you're saying in what's expected of us, there's two, two uh, dimensions, two types of positive choice. One is the bottom line, the commandments, the mitzvahs, do the mitzvahs and don't transgress. As he points out, that can be difficult because it can run contrary to our nature. I am petty, jealous, uh, arrogant, um, lustful, which isn't a bad thing. It's just a question of where it's directed, but lustful of the wrong things or the wrong addresses. So it can be difficult, but it's possible. You're commanded. Do the right thing, don't transgress. That's one area. Now B. Molding one's character to, to conform to God's will, even when there is no explicit commandment to do so. To explain, there is an entire realm of activities referred to as rishur, what is permitted. We are, we are not told what we must do, nor what we must avoid. But that does not mean that there is no godly mode of conduct appropriate for these activities. The initiative, however, is ours. We must strive to discover God's will and then shape our characters accordingly. Continue, go ahead. These two thrusts are reflected in the Mishnah. Make his will your will so that he may fulfill your will as though it were his will. Set aside your will because of his will so that he may set aside the will of others before your will. So what, there's two things being said here. Go continue, next paragraph. Setting aside your will because of his will refers to the challenge of foregoing one's own desires in order to obey God's commandments. But that's the second one. The latter one, the latter statement in the Mishnah just quoted from Ethics of Our Fathers, set aside your will, is talking about A. God commanded, you don't want to do this right now. You're lazy, you're whatever, I don't want to do this. Uh, it's too difficult. Uh, too much of a challenge. I want to do what I want to do. Hashem says it's Shabbos. These are the laws of Shabbos, and it's difficult. So set aside my will. By that, I mean my selfish will, and do what God wants. That's the second half of this quote just quoted. The first one is a difficult, more difficult, a higher level. Make his will your will, even in the area where it's not a commandment. It's everyday life, and there's no specific mitzvah to do right now. There's no specific instruction. God says, now this is your choice, even this gray area, to do the godly thing or not. There's areas in life that God does not overtly um, mandate or govern or give us instructions. And that area is our choice whether to engage it in a godly way or not. I hope he's going to illustrate. If not, I will. So continue. Making his will your, your will refers to a greater challenge. Continue. Making his will your will refers to a greater challenge, the molding of one's character, so that it reflects and expresses God's will, even in situations where God's command is not specific. No, basically, you know, it's in the little, so-called little encounters, engagements, conversations, moments in life, which actually comprise more of our life on the clock then moments were commanded, right? You go to Davin Shachris, or you got to put on film, and it'll take, you put on film, you've done it. You got to give your tzedakah, you know, give your tzedakah, write the check. But then there's all the work that went into producing that. How did you fear there? How do you treat your employees? How honest? And within the, and there's honesty, there's degrees of honesty. There's so many areas that God deliberately leaves up to us. I'm not going to dictate this, says God. You know, you sit down to a meal. It's kosher. That's it. You've fulfilled your divine obligation. But there's the way you eat. 
You eat animalistically. You eat in a refined way. You compliment your wife. It doesn't say in the Torah you have to compliment with the, when you when you're served a a, uh, a course or served or you take the course. But are you? Is this sensitivity? It, it's every area of life. You could you know conduct yourself where you're not faulted. You did nothing wrong, but was it really? Godly? Was it special? Was it a sacred moment? Here's the choice to make every moment sacred, even if it's not a mitzvah right now. It's just an ordinary, casual encounter. But is it humble? Is it with divine aware awareness? Or to use the modern term, is it mindful? Is every moment mindful that this is a gift from Hashem and should be therefore appreciated as such and used as such and shared and so on? So this is a whole area of life, most of our life, that Hashem says, I've given you lots of commandments, but really how to live, I want you to discover this. Based on my commandments, inspired by them, bring that to that area of life. He calls it molding character. I'm not sure. Molding character is very difficult, changing character. It's, I think the emphasis is behavior. Behave. There's always the choice to behave in the appropriate way. To feel, it's hard to legislate feeling. Very difficult. Feel, be humble, you know. You can act humbly, but to feel humble is harder. Love, you can't command an emotion. Act lovingly, yes. Feel respect. It's hard to feel respect, but you can behave respectfully. So when he says here, molding character, maybe we'll just kind of tweak that and say behavior. But again, what are we talking about? What is he talking about now in the text? What are we up to? Not the area of explicit commandments, but the rest of life. So let's continue. Taking the initiative. The, the task of molding one's character represents a more complete expression of our potential for free choice. When a commandment has been given, even though man has the option of obeying or not obeying, the fact that God has given the command spurs obedience, for every Jew has a natural desire to serve God. Moreover, when God's will is explicit, the choice facing man is clear. On the other hand, when God has not given an explicit command and man has to elevate and refine himself until he appreciates what is expected of him, the challenge and the choice are far more encompassing. Okay, so, you know, mitzvahs that are explicit, at some point, you know, okay, you know, fast Jim Kippur, all right, don't eat chametz on Pesach, okay. Um, if it's black and white, God commanded it, that's one level of obedience. But a, a much deeper demand is those areas where it's not explicit, where I can get away with it, as it were, and yet I endeavor to live even those moments in a godly way. And he added... Yeah, all right, so that's a more difficult challenge and the ultimate challenge. Thank you, Ethel. And I'm going to ask um, Robert, Yeshua, this is your parasha. It's all about Yeshua, okay. all right? A new phase. A new phase. This approach to divine service represents- hang, on, hang on one second. Yeah, I'm in the middle of the shear. Flavors. Yeah. What? The final halacha is b'yechidus. They don't make a bracha on the film. No, 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 don't make a bracha, but dav uh, b'yechidus. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. A new phase. This approach to divine service represents. The, the new dimension contributed by this week's Torah reading. The reading begins, Shlach Lecha, you may send. Rashi explains that the people had come to Moshe with a request that spies be sent to explore Eretz Yisrael and that Moshe had brought their request to God. God had replied, it is up to you. I am not commanding you. If you desire, send. In other words, <clears throat> Rashi is addressing is explaining a difficulty, difficulty in the verse. The verse begins, God speaks to Moshe. He says, send for you, 
spies into the land. The story here is, just to re refresh your memory, it's virtually a year, almost a year after the Exodus, they've received the Torah, they've studied its, its laws, and they're ready now to enter the land of Israel. You all know it was the late 40 years, the stories in this week's parsha, because of this incident of the spies. What happened was the Jews said, before we go in, we want to send scouts. Scout is a better term than spy. It's not like they, they're spying to find out about the enemy. So it's more about finding out, ascertaining the terrain and the people in order to facilitate the conquest. I guess it's a kind of spy. All right. So um, they say to the, pe uh, the, the people, say to Moshe, we, uh, we want to send in spies or scouts first. He brings this to God and God says, I'm not commanding you to do this, but if you want, go ahead. That answers the meaning of shlach lecha, send for you. What do you mean send for you? Send. Now she's pointing out this was an unusual command. It didn't initiate with God. It's for you, meaning if that's what you want and that's what they're asking, by all means. It's up to you as you just quoted. I'm not commanding you if you desire sin. Now what he's saying here in our text is, that this represents a new phase in the service of God. In other words, till now, it was God commands, you do. Now we're hearing, it's up to you. So this is a whole new area over and above the commandments that are in our hands. Continue, this represented. This represented a new phase in our people's relationship with God. Previously, the Torah had related the commandments which God had given Moshe for the conduct of the Jewish people. It also described certain situations, for example, the second opportunity to offer the Paschal sacrifice in answer to a query relayed by Moshe to God. But even in those instances, God responded with an explicit command. This is the first occasion in which God leaves the choice to Moshe. Okay, good. And read another piece. Building God's dwelling. This new approach to divine service that the initiative be given to, to man is associated with the objective of the spy's mission. In other words, he's going to explain now, why does this new phase, God saying, I'm giving you X amount of commandments, but that isn't the sum total of your purpose in life. There's a whole area I'm leaving open up to you. And that's real maturity. That's a real connection. Just to illustrate the obvious, you know, the husband and wife relationship. We always invoke that model because our relationship with God is a marriage. So the foundation of it, of course, is obedience. Voluntary, but obedience. Your wife asks, you do. But that isn't enough. It can't be that the relationship is always going to be Okay, honey, what do I do now? If you're really connected, it's even where she doesn't outright say, do it this way or the other way. You just know this is what pleases her. This is what this is how we connect. That's the stuff of a mature relationship where the other partner, and I, it's wife to husband, husband to wife, it's both ways, um, know, feel because of their devotion what the other would like without having to get an explicit directive. And that's a much deeper gift. You know, it's one thing when it's my birthday and so the spouse says to, to, the, to the wife, the husband says, so what would you like me to buy for your birthday? Okay, so she tells him I like this and he goes and buys it. That's a beautiful moment. He asked that much richer and deeper would be, he doesn't ask her. He knows her taste now because he's so in tune with, if he doesn't, he asks the kids. Uh, what she likes, and then on her birthday, gives it to her. That's a much deeper connection. I didn't have to tell you. You not just figured it out. You, you know what I want because you're in tune to me. That is much deeper, much richer. Now, what he's explaining now is, why does this phase in our relationship with God begin with the context of the whole entering into Israel? Why, why didn't this phase kick in earlier when they're in the desert? They're a whole year in the desert. It only starts now going into Israel because he's going to explain going into Israel. That's what it's all about. It's about this new phase of relationship that comes from within much deeper connection. Continue. 
The goal of life in Eretz Yisrael is to fashion a dwelling for God within the realities of everyday experience. Right, so th that's what's happening now in Israel. In the desert, pretty much, you know, just commandment, do. Nothing else to do. But now they're going into a whole world now, economics and, and, and a country and a state. It's whole areas of life which are not specific commandments. It's the business of living now, building a home. That's where it counts. That's where it starts. So many areas of choice. We're not going to be held by the hand and told. But it, it should come from within because of your connection. That model that relationship between God and the Jewish people only really begins when they leave the cocoon of the desert. Continue, more particularly. More particularly, this dwelling should be established by man's initiative. Were the dwelling to be established by a revelation from above, it would be incomplete. Man, as he exists within his own context and the power of creativity he possesses, would not be reflected within it. When, by contrast, man transforms his own will and on the basis of this inner metam metamorphosis proceeds to transform his surroundings. God comes to dwell within our existence. All right, so using the example of a marriage again, a home. A home's got to be reflective of the people that live there. And what makes the home again is not where one spouse is just simply tell me and I'll do it. It's not a classroom. That's the classroom. That's the first model. Teacher, student, finished. And marriage is not teacher, student. It's, it's got to be complete oneness. So that is that every aspect of the home is a reflection of the other's desire or both their desires naturally. Naturally. Rephrase that. A home should express in every detail of it, we. The we should naturally be expressed in every part of the house. The classroom isn't we. Teacher, student. Instructions, follow it. Good. But a marriage is not this, it's this. And actually it's this, it's becoming, becoming one. So becoming one is even when he's not telling me outright what to do, I just feel I know what you want, we're one. Deeper still, I haven't said this, now deeper still. Your desire is my desire. Not I figured out what you want. What you want is therefore what I want. That's what makes me happy. That's what fulfills me. That's a real marriage. That's a real home. Where each one's desires, I said, is we, not us. I'm just reminded there was a, a wonderful, uh, much beloved rabbi who lived in Jerusalem, Rabbi Yisrael. Rabbi Yisrael was a Levin. Arya, I'm sorry, Arya. Maybe you saw Arya. Arya Levin. Uh, they, it was known as the Tzaddik of Jerusalem. And uh, he, he was there from the very beginning, 1948, and a uh, much beloved figure across the board. All Jews loved him. In particular, rapport with the, with the uh, Chayalim. There's a book written about him called The Tzaddik of Jerusalem. He passed away from, in the early 70s, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, the story goes just about him. He's a beautiful... Uh, Wonderful example. He went to the doctor with his wife. She had some problem with her foot. And he says to the doctor, our foot hurts. It's spontaneous. Isn't it? Our foot hurts. Her foot. Our foot. That's a marriage. It's just reflective of becoming one in the deepest way. So that spontaneously, my choices <laughs> are not mine selfishly. It's our Okay, let's continue. And that's what the home is. Going into Israel is about the stuff of living, making this world a home for God. Let's continue. Um, yeah, Robert, continue. Yeshua. Okay, facing failure. Since the focus is on man's initiative, there is a possibility of error. Oh, this is where it gets dicey. You know, if you're not being told outright and you've got to figure it out, then that uh, could be error because there's ego, it's the constant struggle to transcend ego. The marriage I just described is idyllic, but by no means um, easy. It takes work. It takes work to go beyond my external selfish self and connect to you in a very deep selfless way, which is really the deeper me, true, but it takes work to get to the deeper me. 
So continue. The very term free choice. The very term free choice implies that one may make the wrong choice. Indeed, in our Torah reading, the wrong choice was actually made. Yeah, it was, it's a, the end of the story of the spies was that it was the wrong choice. In the, the spies, end. Sorry. Yeah, continue. The spies returned and spread panic among the Jewish people, making them afraid to enter Eretz Yisrael. As the narrative indicates, however, this error can be corrected through teshuva, a sincere return to God. In this context, context as well, the emphasis is on man's initiative. For teshuva requires a person to summon inner strength in order to reestablish the bond with God that has been severed through his improper conduct. Indeed, through teshuva, a person can surpass his previous level of divine service. As our sages teach, perfect sadikim, righteous men, cannot stand in the place of a bow teshuva. Okay, so the good news is, it's a big struggle to, try, to transcend ego and all relationships, and we're bound to fail. There's bound to be hurt. There's bound to be betrayal, capital B, God forbid, or a small b. Such is the stuff of life. We're not born selfless. That's the whole struggle. But the good news is there's teshuva. Even when we have hurt, violated, we can dig deeper and repair and transform the relationship. Our relationship with God is described in the Torah full of setbacks, constantly. Right after the giving of the Torah, this glorious moment, that was the chuppah. That was the marriage and it was the most um, beautiful, dramatic, you know, talk about special, to, you know, people today, you know, they want these uh, destination marriages. It's, it's all, it, all, all the, the craze. What destination marriage, the middle of the desert, this mountain, thunder and lightning. I mean, it couldn't get more dramatic. I'm looking for another word, more, uh, maybe even romantic and, uh, than that. And yet, 40 days later, Betrayal, it almost, it's in tatters, shatters, and almost beyond recovery. But then comes to Shuvah, and it's, we reconnect, and it's deeper. And it doesn't end there. Then there's the story of the spies. And this past week, we read like three or four uh, sins, betrayal, complaints, and not easy. It's a lifelong struggle to go beyond the ego. But the good news is, that with every failure, we have the strength the ability to repair and go even deeper. Now comes big news. Next paragraph. The possibility exists for teshuva even without sin. Whoa, is this is a big statement. Teshuva is classically um, rendered, translated as repentance. Repentance is, as I just described, after failure, we, uh, there's teshuva, we reconnect. And, uh, now we're saying there's teshuva even when there's no sin. What's it, what's it to do teshuva for? Answer, continue. As our sages say, Mashiach will motivate the righteous to turn to God in tshuva. The big word is the righteous. One of the great achievements of Mashiach will be, he will inspire, teach, and show, and it's already happening, that's not for now, even the tzaddikim to do tshuva. What are they doing tshuva for? They live righteous lives. He doesn't explain why, so I'll have to tell you. Because, friends, even within the perfect relationship, it never ends. There's always ever and ever greater degrees of appreciation and devotion. So my devotion to you today, compared to, but because of, rephrase that. Today, my appreciation of you deepens, and the privilege to be in a relationship with you deepens such that the way I appreciated yesterday falls short. That's the teshuva. It's an ever deepening humility and awe and wonder and, 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 and gra gr gratitude for being in this relationship. So even the tzaddik does teshuva. And I've told you this story and I'll repeat it again because it's very instructive, very, very quickly. That illustrates the point, the true story. The great Rabbi Sadjir gone, but our greatest leaders lived some 800, 900 years ago. So the story goes, he was once traveling and he came to an inn. The innkeeper didn't know that he was upside your gone. He received him, it was at night and uh, showed him his room. 
The next morning, people came from near and far to receive his blessing, guidance, counsel, and said to him, he was a great halachic authority, a great sage. Inkiba now realizes that the guest that he received the night before is upside to God. So he falls at his feet asking for forgiveness. Tearfully, Rebbe, forgive me. Upside to picks him up and kisses him on the fraud. He said, my child, what are you? He says, Rebbe, Rebbe, the way I received you last night, to which Absadja Gon said, everything was, in, was perfectly in order. This. He said, yes, yes, Rebbe. But had I known it was you, it would be completely different. Likewise, in an ever deepening relationship of being Jewish with Hashem or in, our, in relationships, friends, spouses, whatever, as we mature and, and appreciate even deeper the gift that we have of these friendships, of these relationships, then my devotion to you yesterday is fall short of my new appreciation today. And so it continues endlessly. Okay, continue. Through such, through such, efforts, through such efforts, the advantage reached through teshuva can be accomplished without a prior descent. This is the ultimate expression of man's power to set out on his own initiative, accomplish his objective and turn to God with the all encompassing inner bond that is established through teshuva. Thank you very much. Terry, can I ask you to read the, la read the last section of people's mission? I'll start my day here. Um, the above concepts are alluded to in the name of the Torah reading Shalach. Shalach means send, indicating that every person, and in a larger sense, the Jewish people as a whole is sent out, caused to leave their natural environment and charged with a mission. This mission enables both the individual and the nation to reach a higher rung. All right, so what you're saying is, the name of the parasha is Shlach, send, we're all shluchim. We're all sent on, the, on a, both a personal and collective mission. And part of our mission, by the way, is to inspire the whole world to know that we are all on a mission. We're all responsible for each other. We all have an indispensable role to play in making this world a home for God and for all humanity. Let's continue in a personal sense. In a personal sense, this refers to the mission of every soul as, as it is sent down from the spiritual realms to being clothed within a material body. This is a descent for the sake of ascent, uh, uh, for by using materi material in titles for spiritual purposes, the soul progresses to a higher level than that from which it started. This is a big idea, which you're not going to go into detail. Nobody's saying the soul comes down to the world. It's not a punishment. By coming down to the world and making the, the body and the whole world a divine sanctuary for God, this causes the soul the ultimate ascent, the deepest connection. In a larger sense, continue. In a larger sense, this refers to the mission of the Jewish people to make our world a dwelling fit for God. Sent out from continent to continent, our nation has labored toward this objective for thousands of years, adding spiritual content to the world through the observance of the Torah and its mitzvahs. What he's saying now is throughout a long history, we've been sent from one continent to the other. And the reason is in every place that we go to bring the godly, to elevate, to sanctify, to make that world a home for God. What we're seeing today, friends, I know many of us are very alarmed with the, uh, for many shocking emergence of, of anti-Semitism, of naked Jew hatred, um, all over the world. I was just told yesterday that Israelis are also feeling it. Hmm. Because not, not that they, I, I thought he meant, or they're in tune to what's happening in Los Angeles and in Montreal and in New York. No. In addition to that, in Israel itself, communities that were long held as um, the models of peaceful coexistence between Jews and non-Jews. There are many cities in Israel that, you know, for years there never been incidents. Now there are from neighbors, and they're shocked. They're used to the enemy, you know, outside, but not your neighbor. And they're feeling this in Israel. This is a new thing. And certainly all of us around the world. So many of us are alarmed, but I got the good news. Here's the good news. Number one, let's remember, anti-Semitism and what we're seeing 
is not the anti-Semitism of old in the sense, it's not institutionalized, it's not coming from governments, whether governments are combating it effectively or not, it's another question and it's up to us to prod them, but it's not policy like it was for millennia. Anti-Semitism was policy, starting in the halls of government or the halls of, of uh, the monarch. Not true today, anywhere in the world. I'm gonna shock you, this past week in Tehran, Listen. In, in, in Tehran, they, uh, a beautiful mikveh, a state-of-the-art mikveh, was just inaugurated. The latest technology, beautiful, you can see, go online and look it up in two seconds. You'll find it, uh, mikveh in Tehran, Tehran. Now that's pretty telling. So what's going on? We're running out of time, and this is a big subject. Here's the good news, friends. It's the last hurrah. It's cleanup, mop-up operation. Redemption is about to come. We're on the threshold of Mashiach's coming. And therefore, it's the last death throes. They're coming from just groundswell of, of but, but, but resistance against God and the Jew. And, and how do we fight it? By becoming more Jewish, less apologetic, more Jewish, and uncompromisingly proud public Jews, starting with our leadership in Israel and each one of us wherever we are. I, I just saw quickly someone was saying, if, you know, take off your kippah, if because, uh, no. Now we'll start wearing our kippah more. We're not going to cower. There's nothing to cower for. Our strength, it's, we're light, and this is darkness. And you don't, the old Yiddish expression, you don't drive out darkness with a broom. You turn the light on, gone. So the stronger the light, the less it, it will just dissipate. It has no real substance. It's just the final, you know what it is? It's the final objection of the root of it is the ego to Hashem being revealed on earth to Mashiach's coming. It's a desperate, okay. has no, no substance, deflate in a moment with conviction and with truth. That's the answer. Okay, so let's conclude. I, I, I just, I'm sorry, uh, Terry, I, I muted everybody. Thanks. You have to unmute yourself. This objective is no longer an abstract goal. On the contrary, we are standing at the threshold of redemption moments before the consummation of this task through the coming of Mashiach. And then we will merit the complete fulfillment of the promise of our Torah reading. I will bring them there and they will know the land. May this take place in the immediate future. I mean, I think uh, Ricky just posted, did you just post the... Uh... The link to the, that mikveh thing? Yes. Yeah, you did. <clears throat> yes. Stunning new mikveh opens in Tehran. I mean, it's mind boggling. It's a sign from Hashem. Kindalach. Be more Jewish. This is the answer. <laughs> I find it almost comical. You know, well, Jews are getting upset and agitated. They're sending around emails. For this email, for this email. That's the answer to for an email. And who are you forwarding it to? Your fellow Jews are preaching to the converted. Forwarding emails is not the answer. It's a nice thing, isn't the hate? The answer is be more Jewish out there. Visibly, tangibly, concretely. And again, starting with our leadership. Stand up for Jewish lives, Jewish blood. No, apolog no apologetics. Say the truth. Say the truth. The truth is we didn't usurp anybody's home. This is our God-given home for thousands of years. We're so terrible in PR because we're not convinced ourselves of who and what we are. That's why we're so terrible at it. It's time to gain clarity and conviction as to what our mission is. Shlach lecha. Our mission, Israel is integral to our mission. That's the parsha this week. We can embrace that with full, joyous, humble conviction. This whole thing is going to blow, not just blow over, be transformed. 
bold words, but it's the truth, not my the truth of Torah. So don't be don't be alarmed. It's 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 actually a good sign. It's a good sign that we're combating this. But the way to do it is with, only with the MS, only with the truth, not with not with not with any other means which I won't go into. The old PR and so on. Not working on bicycles, it's not the truth. Say the truth. That's what we understood. That's what's appreciated. And with this, we march forward and march to redemption. Thank you all for listening, for joining today. Have a wonderful week. Thank you to our readers and everybody else. And Thank you, forward. Rabbi. Yep. Thank you. Yes, you call. God bless you yeah. all. God bless everybody and future readers Amen. next week that we will call Amen. upon in Mitzvah Have a wonderful week. You too. God bless you all. Bye. Bye.